This week, SoFi stock has had a pretty crazy couple of days. Within 48 hours, they had a major executive leaving the company, their second executive in the past two weeks alone. They had a competitor release what in my opinion is a superior credit card product offering. And that same day, they had the NASDAQ updated short interest filings, which showed a 23% short interest for SoFi, a record high for the company. And despite all this, the stock is closed absolutely flat. Let's talk about it. Okay, so let's jump into the news. I'm recording this on Friday intraday because the market is closed today and I don't expect there to be major news today. SoFi opened up this week at $7.30. It also closed off this week at $7.30, absolutely flat over the week. It went up slightly on Tuesday, it went down slightly on Wednesday, but nothing crazy for us to really drill down into further. As always, I do these recaps on a weekly basis, so if you enjoy these videos and you want to follow along, subscribe for more. Starting off the news week chronologically, on Monday, we got more details around the TGL Golf League, which is sponsored by SoFi, slated to start in January of 2025 at a brand new facility down in Florida called the SoFi Center. Here we can see what the renderings of the SoFi Center will look like, and this post was made on X Monday morning by TGL. As well, you can see SoFi logo all over the center, as well as embedded in the TGL logo itself, which is going to be you know all over the place in terms of broadcasting. And in the thread, the TGL highlighted that this would all be featured on ESPN. The post continued with a long thread around everything you need to know about this TGL Golf League, the play format, the rules, how the simulator worked. And if you remember back in late 2023, there was an issue with the roof caving in uh, when they were constructing the SoFi Center. And as a result of this, the league was pushed back to January 2025 because originally this was meant to start in 2024. This is coming at a time when you see the branding for SoFi all over the place. Just think about that, right? Maybe you're on ESPN and you have it on the TV all day long. You see the TGL Golf League, SoFi's logo is all over the place. And then you have a football game come on, SoFi's logo is all over the place. And then at night you have an NBA game come on and guess what? SoFi's logo is all over the place. And so the brand value of over the span of a single day, you can now watch three different leagues that show SoFi's logo. I think that can't be understated because when we were talking about this back in late 2023, the NBA deal wasn't public information. It wasn't announced yet. And so it seems as though in very quick succession, again, from a perception point of view, SoFi is going to expand to multiple different sports avenues and they're all going to converge at the same time in January in the new year that it's going to seem as though this brand just came out of the woodwork, came out of nowhere and is ready to enter prime time. And obviously, as I've mentioned in the past, that's very beneficial for new member additions, but also for the unaided brand awareness aspect in general, that metric that essentially quantifies how recognizable a company's brand is. That's something that SoFi is actively working to improve so as to expand to a larger total addressable market of potential users that it can acquire in the future. And the way that it's doing that is through different sports leagues. And now for the TGL post, as of 2025, we're going to have three sports leagues that show SoFi's logo, and we're expecting more as we continue to expand. Moving on with regards to SoFi news, on Tuesday morning, we saw an 8K come out with the resignation of Chad Borton, who was the president of SoFi Bank for the past two and a half years. The actual resignation itself was made on March 21st, and the final day will be on April the 12th, 2024. So there's a couple of weeks in between there to oversee the transition period. And this will be the second major executive departure within the company over the last two weeks alone, after Aaron Webster, the former chief risk officer, was replaced back in February, and a month later resigned and went to join PayPal on March 15th. I made a full video breakdown on all of these executives, along with the details behind the departure, so I won't dive too far in depth on this one. I'd urge you to watch that video if you haven't seen it already. One thing I will say though, is that these individuals have their own reasons for leaving, and it seems as though from an outside looking in, people wanna talk about the gossip, they wanna talk about a power struggle internally, at the executive level of this massive company. But the fact of the matter is that these departures, the timing around them can very easily be explained by the restricted stock units vested. Once the stock's vested, the executives are then free to take their leave because obviously they're gonna wait to see their stock vesting before they leave. And just take that back to yourselves, right? Like if you're at a company and then you have stocks that are vesting at the beginning of March, and you wanna leave the company, generally speaking, you're gonna wait until those stocks vest so you can get that payout and then you're gonna leave afterwards. And so I think that's what's happening here with regards to Chad Borton and Aaron Webster leaving in such close succession with each other. Otherwise, 
you'd be leaving a lot of money on the table if you just ignored the stock vesting schedule. And so it's not surprising for me for these announcements to come in such close succession. In the 8K filing earlier on Tuesday, it mentioned that Borton would be replaced by the VP at SoFi Bank, Paul Mayer, who was originally tapped, interestingly enough, to head up SoFi Bank back in 2021 when SoFi acquired Golden Pacific Bank Corp. Now, for the full details around these departures, make sure to check out the other video that I posted on Tuesday. Now, also in a new 8K on Tuesday, we found out that SoFi ended up issuing 72.6 million shares to pay off the $600 million of the 2026 convertible notes. So basically back in the beginning of March, when they had the 2029 senior convertible note offering, they also had the 600 million payoff of the 2026 notes. It was originally estimated to be 61 million shares in that statement, but they ended up issuing more than that due to the weakness in the stock price. They had to issue more shares to pay off that same amount of debt. Chris Hager made a post about this, and I added saying that it could explain some of the recent selling pressure. Uh, you know, we've been seeing on the stock over the past month. But the takeaway here is that the float is essentially a little bit larger because they issued more shares to pay off that debt. Now, also on Wednesday, we got updated numbers of the short interest filings as of March 15th to an all time new record of 209 million shares sold short, up from 154 million in the previous filing. Per Fintel, this represents a 23% short interest on SoFi and an absolutely staggering number, almost double in just a few months earlier on January 12th. January 12th, they had 118 million shares, and now it's 77% higher at 209 million shares in just a matter of you know 60 days or so. And one thing to note is that this filing is as of March 15th. It doesn't account for the Chad Borton resignation news. It doesn't account for what's been going on over the past two weeks where the stock has been you know, somewhat flat, let's say. And I'm sure with regards to Chad Borton, it's gonna be perceived as negative news by the market. But regardless of that, because I don't think it's huge news, this is an absolutely mind-blowing amount, especially considering where we stand with the underlying business of SoFi itself. And the reason why I say this is because my underlying assumption when making these videos is that SoFi is going to come out and absolutely crush their Q1 numbers. They're going to confirm that profitability is sustainable, and they're going to plant the seeds of doubt in the minds of analysts that their end-of-year price targets for EPS are astronomically low. If we've been reading between the lines of what Anthony Noto has been saying in the Mad Money interview, in previous appearances, in the convertible note press release, all of this should point to the direction that SoFi is going to be very profitable this year, but still the estimates are very low. Now, of course, this is all assumptions that I'm operating under. This is probably bias on my part. And if that's not the case, then I'm missing something here because the short interest is actually justified in that case. But if this is the case and I'm not missing anything, then this short interest has increased in such a short period of time that it's surprising to say the very, very least. Noto mentioned that the shorting was normal when doing an offering of this nature. When you do a convertible, there is pressure on the stock from investors shorting the stock against the convertible right. to delta hedge. That does happen. So there is typically five to 10% decline. But the reason why we did it is really important because I think this is what will put some momentum back into the stock. So obviously the delta hedging does have a role to play in this short interest number rising, but if it continues to rise over the next couple of reports, a lot of the comments that I got in my post and the sentiment it seems from retail investors is starting to look for a short squeeze, which does happen from time to time and has the potential to send the stock much higher, especially when sparked by something fundamentally positive in the underlying company, such as let's say a great Q1. So we'll see where this goes, but 23% is something that we've never seen before. One thing I do wanna mention, just going back to my earlier piece of news, is that since more shares were issued, these extra 72 million shares, the total amount of shares outstanding has increased. So I'm not sure about the percentage of whether that's accounted for in NASDAQ's numbers, since both of these reports came out on Wednesday, or whether the percentage is slightly smaller as a result of that. You can just divide the 209 million by the total float as of the latest numbers and get the actual short interest percentage, which is accurate. It should be around 23% or 21% respectively. Finally, the last piece of news that I wanted to spend just a moment talking about was this Robinhood offering, which was unveiled on Wednesday night. Now, with regards to this Robinhood news, I also made a video earlier this week with my first impressions and the full details of that. I'm gonna attach at the end of this video as well for you to select. But for Robinhood, what they released in my opinion, as a product person, is a superior product offering on the broker side of the business. And yes, I do know that many people are going to be arguing to say that Robinhood does not compete directly with SoFi. And yes, this is true. 
in many of the business segments, the majority of the business lines that SoFi operates in, as a result of them having a bank charter, are not the business lines that Robinhood operates in. SoFi makes the majority of their money through lending. Robinhood is mainly a brokerage side of the business. I get it. However, the companies do have a direct competition when it comes to something like credit cards because Robinhood offers their credit card, SoFi offers their credit card. If I'm on the market for a credit card, I'm gonna pick one or the other. And as a result, these companies do compete with each other with regards to the offerings that they have. It's as simple as that. As a consumer, you're gonna pick one card or you're gonna pick the other and that's who you do business with. So to say that they don't compete is both true and false because in most areas they don't compete, but in some areas like credit cards, they do. Now, without going into the weeds too much here, uh, what I will say with regards to Robinhood's offering is I think it's superior from a product perspective. I think their app in general caters to that user experience very highly. And yes, it does have the potential to steal some market share away from SoFi's future growth in their credit card business specifically. So affecting the growth of the financial services segment. And of course, looking at it from the flip side to say that the drawback of this offering is skepticism whether Robinhood can maintain that profitability with this offering because the tightrope that they have to walk as a company is on one hand offering very eye-watering benefits for their users, which is fantastic from a user experience perspective, but they have to counterbalance that with the lack of profitability that they're gonna get. The more money that you give to your users in the form of benefits, the less money you have to collect for yourself in the form of profitability. And so Robinhood investors are gonna be waiting to see the profitability metrics that come from this. What are the actual dollars and cents? Does the math math, essentially? Uh, I know the volume has been really strong of people that are signing up for Robinhood, and that's fair. A lot of money is gonna enter their ecosystem, but if the math doesn't math, if, if Robinhood is losing money on every single user, they're not gonna be able to maintain that product for a very long time time and it's going to ultimately be something that hurts them as a business fundamentally. But if they do manage to work out the math, this could be a massively profitable offering for them. SoFi investors, on the other hand, I think are going to be waiting to see whether SoFi has any response to this product offering, whether they're going to be amping up their benefits for their own credit card to try to compete head to head, or whether they're just going to ignore it and focus on other segments of the business and carry on business as usual. I mentioned in earlier videos that, you know, I think there should be a response from SoFi side of the business to remain competitive competitive, but obviously not if the math doesn't add up. If it's not a profitable side of the business, then I don't want SoFi to blindly compete. They have to do what's best for their ecosystem and their entire user base in general, regardless of that one sliver of product offering. Credit cards is a pretty insignificant product from a revenue perspective from SoFi. It's actually not even profitable as a product line for SoFi. So SoFi could be totally focused on something else that's not credit card related at all. Anyways, without harping on that one too much, to wrap up this video, the updated short interest numbers were in my mind the biggest piece of SoFi specific news that we saw this week, along with the resignation of the SoFi Bank president, Chad Borton. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I try to respond to as many comments as I possibly can. I really appreciate your support. Share this out with somebody who is interested in SoFi. Make sure to tune into this channel later tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern for the SoFi Weekly Podcast. And thank you so much for watching and I'll see you there.